How's it going, everybody? Welcome back for Week 10, Mon Hill's Audio Hour. Uh, this is actually, uh, topic-wise, when I planned this out originally, uh, the topics we're going to cover today, I was originally planning to spread out over two weeks, but uh, I got to looking at it, and as I was planning the episode, I, I realized that I could probably condense all of these topics into one episode. Uh, so this is both week 10 and 11 topics. Uh, in general, we're going to be talking about auxiliary parts, uh, background vocals, strings, horns, and percussion, as in like tambourines, cowbells, uh, you know, shakers, claps, things like that. Um, all of these various parts are applied 
in addition to the standard uh, array of rhythm section instruments, which is why they're called auxiliary parts, um, and they're added to fill lingering musical space not filled by the rhythm section, uh, which is really cool. It allows you to, uh, from an arranging and producing standpoint, it allows you to add a lot of really interesting variety and color to your songs from a musical standpoint. Uh, but just because there is musical space for a part does not necessarily mean that there's frequency space for a part. So with auxiliary parts, even more so than with rhythm section elements or lead vocals, you have to be even more cognizant and have an even better, an even clearer idea uh, in your head of what frequency space you're willing to give up to these parts. And generally, it's going to be pretty pretty small uh, ranges. Um, a lot of times, your mix of the rhythm section will determine what ranges those are, um, as in, you know, whatever frequency ranges that you have space not occupied by the rhythm section or the lead vocal, uh, those might be areas where you can uh, either leave flat or even boost in auxiliary parts, and then pretty much everywhere else you're going to be attenuating as much as possible. Um, because auxiliary parts, by definition, aren't really the focus. These are the ornamental parts. These are the kind of uh, ear candy to just kind of make sure you're still awake after the first chorus, you know. So uh, with that, we're going to dive right in. I'm also going to warn you up top, uh, I didn't have any examples of uh, sessions that used all four of these groups of instruments at the same time. So you're going to have to bear with me throughout this episode. There's going to be a lot of me uh, switching sessions. So just keep that in mind. But we're going to go ahead and get started with background vocals. So let me switch over for you. Okay, so here we have our session. We got drum set, bass, uh, electric guitar, a couple acoustic guitars, lead vocal, and then a whole mess of background vocals. These, these pinkish, magenta-ish channels here are all background vocal parts. Um, all of these are not individual these aren't all unique parts, um, but from a producing standpoint, when you're recording auxiliary parts, especially background vocals, you don't always just want to record one of something. Uh, for me, whenever I'm doing a part that's on a syllable, which is to say not on a lyric, um, like just oohs or ahs, Typically, I'm going to record each part three times. So if you look at my titling here, I've got one, two, three, four. So this is a four-part harmony, but each harmony part, I had the singer sing it three different times. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, one of them is, most obviously, it just makes it sound like there's more singers. Like instead of it being, you know, one singer or you know one singer singing four parts it sounds like 12 voices singing a four-part harmony um, the other upside is it allows you to spread these out across the stereo field um, so that way uh, it kind of allows you to maintain a balance one of of the parts themselves relative to each other and it also allows you to keep them kind of away from the center, keeps them away from your mono content. Uh, when I'm thinking about panning, I'm typically putting my auxiliary parts to the like furthest to the outside. Like I'm usually hard panned uh, all the way left or right. Or in this case, as you can see, I've staggered it um, with uh, 
I typically tend to go whatever the highest part is, that's the furthest to the outside, and then it gets progressively closer to the center the lower the part goes in pitch. Um, so I'm spread out between 81% left and right and all the way left and right. Um, obviously, these are all going to be processed the same way, so these are all coming to a bus. Uh, the reason there's two buses on this particular song is there's a this is a just a syllable pad four part harmony and then this this stuff over here again it's all triple tracked but this is a three part harmony of kind of a counter line um but they're processed uh the same way um so let me go ahead and give you guys an idea of what this sounds like Uh, I'll just play where they're all in here. So, as you can see, background vocals in this case are uh, purely acting as as kind of like a synth pad, like just kind of providing a bass, a harmonic bass for uh, the other parts to kind of live around. Um, and this is fun uh, to add because, like in this case, your only other harmonic reference is the acoustic guitar, which is kind of doing the same strumming pattern the whole time, uh, which is nice. That that provides a nice like rhythmic motion. This uh, this background vocal part being on held tones uh, kind of makes that more consistent and allows you to make it kind of more atmospheric. It also allows you to, uh, again, from a production standpoint, allows you to incorporate more extended harmonies than what the guitar might be playing, or vice versa. If the guitar was playing a really complicated harmony, uh, the background vocals might elect to hold down a more conventional harmony, like triads or things like that. Uh, but yeah, we can get into the mixing of it here. Uh, but before we do that, we'll go ahead and play this last chorus without the background vocals. Standing on. So it sounds fine on its own without them. Uh, but you can tell that this is a very sparse instrumental arrangement. Uh, and there's plenty of musical space for other things. Um, and if we want, we can go and look at our RTA here and kind of get a visual idea of uh, frequency space that's unused. So if we play the track. Standing on, look down the canyons, molded by standing, still when I've tried. Okay, so you can see that our low end is nice and full. Uh, and then it trends downward, which frequencies will kind of tend to do anyway, but you notice we've got a dip here around 3000 and that dip kind of trends over to about call it 7000 um, so a lot of like upper mid to high kind of bright space that we're kind of missing in this mix overall without the vocals so they can definitely be very prominent there and this is a very 
common frequency use that you're going to see throughout today with the other parts as well. Um, usually there's the most space and it's easiest to find space in the upper frequency ranges uh, because not every part has those frequencies in it and even when they do sometimes you're uh, rolling those off because you don't need them. Uh, that's not to say there's not going to be any low mid content in it. There will be just not nearly as much as there will be top end content. So uh, just to show you the mix here. So first thing that I'm doing is compressing before I EQ because I want to turn all these disparate parts into sounding more or less like one instrument. Um, you can see I've got my pan and my fader balance set so each harmony part uh, plays back relative to the other harmony parts the way I want it. It sets the balance of the chord the way I choose and then I'm compressing it on the way in before I do anything else to it just so I can kind of flatten out uh, the dynamic and frequency curves of it. You see, it's really, it's just kind of grabbing those attacks and smoothing them out. And then on the sustain, it relaxes a good bit. It's also, I really like this compressor a lot. Uh, an LA-3A adds a nice uh, coloration, especially to female vocals. Um, so it's both smoothing out and adding character. Then I'm going to EQ. So you can see I'm taking out uh, most of the sub frequencies up to 135 and I'm low passing down to 15 kilohertz. Then I'm actually boosting a little bit uh, below 300, just a tiny bit, like half a decibel uh, because I know that I'm going to cut my low mids. So this is just to make sure that it doesn't lose all of its body. Otherwise it would kind of sound like it was coming out of a tin can. Um, so just bending that low shelf up just a tad to compensate for the amount that I'm going to take out of the low mid. So then I'm cutting uh, over here at about 700 hertz uh, by 6 dB. Uh, just getting that out of the way. That's where those acoustic guitars are. Um, some of the like first harmonics of the bass things like that uh, so that just keeps that out of the way of the those uh, those fundamentals then we're going to cut again at 4000 um, that's clarity of uh, vocal the lead vocal um, and guitar as well um, so just keeping it out of that range but you notice that we left most of the like mid frequencies like the one to two thousand free and then remember where that dip was uh we're taking 6k and boosting it on the high shelf to kind of fill up where that empty frequency space was um so here just to show you here's without it Standing on. overlapping any other parts and just kind of gets carved down into its own space. Uh, then we're adding a fun effect <laughs> as if 12 weren't enough. We're adding uh, what's called a doubler. Uh, kind of like a, it's kind of like a bunch of fast delays uh, that don't repeat. Uh, it allows you to kind of spread out. It like repeats the signal and allows you to spread it out on the sides and delay it by a couple milliseconds. Um, in this case, I can do it four times. Um, I'll show you, I'll solo this up so you can hear like what it's doing. So that's with it, without it. Kind 
has a chorusing effect, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, but to me, this this just kind of takes it out of focus a little bit, which is a desirable effect in this case. It's a subtle effect, but it makes it seem less direct. It's less like right next to you and kind of more washed out. And then we're going to EQ again. Uh, this is a, uh, again, I, we might, we've probably talked about this a little bit, but this is a, a pull tech EQ, which allows you, it's, it's only shelving and it allows you to boost and cut uh, the same frequency range at the same time, which kind of creates, it allows you to kind of make compromises and take the best of both like so I'm using this to add back some body without it but I'm also attenuating it to like prevent it from stacking up more than I want and getting in the way of the bass and the guitar I'm also adding a little bit more top end but then attenuating below that uh, to keep it from getting too harsh uh, So here how it's kind of like breathy and thin. So this kind of thickens it up a little bit. It keeps the air, but it tames it. Um, and the low end is, is present without being in the way. One more quick little EQ move really just cutting uh, 700 again because it added some of that back when we shelved up the low end. So one other trend you'll notice as we get into this is that with the exception of percussion, all of these auxiliary parts generally will take more processing than anything else just to make them fit. Um, going to take m generally more equalization um, in order to make it work with the rest of the track. It's also, you're generally going to see compression, at least one compression stage before equalization, uh, just to kind of homogenize everything and turn it into a more cohesive sound uh, before you do anything else to it. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, a quick explanation of considerations for uh, like pad style background vocals. We'll talk about on lyric background vocals in another session, but um, I'm going to move on to we'll do strings and then I'll bear with me while I switch sessions. Okay, we're back. Um, okay, here is this other session. Uh, this one isn't released yet, so I'm going to keep the, the vocal elements muted. But uh, yeah, here's a song with a string section on it. I'll play you back the track here.
So you notice there are background vocals, like pad type background vocals, like we talked about earlier, as well as a string section, which I promise uh, presented a bit of a challenge in the mix to make both of those fit with what was kind of already a fairly dense instrumental. Um, but I, th I think they, you know, they live in a, uh, they cohabitate nicely at this point. Um, so we've already talked about these. So this, this kind of reddish channel here is my string section. So let me get into this here. So first up, I did elect to do a little bit of an EQ before I compressed, just to kind of manage it um, for the next step that I was going to do, which we'll go get into here. But So the dry strings sound like this. And then... So I cut a lot of low end up to 200, low pass down to 15 or 16 and a half. Um, and then I'm making fairly small moves with the exception of this low mid here at uh, uh, 540 hertz. I'm taking 7 dB out of that. Um, what that sounds like without it. So that's where that that piano is. Uh, a lot of the uh, like the first harmonics of that piano are right there. So it gets that out of the way of that. I'm rolling off just a tiny bit, like one dB of, on the low shelf, uh, to keep it out of the way of uh, like the drum kit, like the snares and toms. Um, rolling off my mids at. 20 at 2.4 K uh, just a little bit to get that harshness um, and then adding a little bit of brightness at 8 K just a little bit a little over a DB I'm also adding some compression here um, 2.4 ratio barely hitting just just a little bit because my next stage is a limiter, which is like a really, really fast compressor. Um, this is something that I found really, I really only find myself doing it with string sections like this. Um, when you kind of just want to, like when they're a, a filler element like this, rather than like the main part of a song, when they're an auxiliary element, uh, you kind of want to, they're easier to manage if you suck all the dynamics out of them and then you can add fader automation after the fact to kind of reintroduce some dynamics, but it's only where you want it. Um, so I'm actually limiting in the mix, which isn't something that I do literally ever at any other time except on strings. Uh, but this is what that does. And this is a fairly subtle change, but uh, you kind of feel it more than you hear it. So that really aggressively is kind of making everything, bringing all those parts up to the same level. Um, so that's done that. But if you notice, it's adding back some of that mud that we cut out. So then we're going to EQ again. We're high passing again, cutting. Uh, some mid range here at uh, 375 again, 900, and then this big notch filter here at uh, 1500 because there was like this harmonic, you can kind of hear it. Uh, all the summation of the strings, and this is a, a really indicative thing of string parts is that they will all interact with each other and probably create these harsh uh, overtones. So you sometimes have to tame those. And there was one really prominent one uh, at 1500 hertz. 
So just notch that frequency out entirely. So it sits a little bit of, a little bit better, but it's it's kind of starting to lose its life a little bit. So we're gonna go back to our friend the Bulltech. Add back a lot of this low end that it is missing, but it's in a range that it doesn't exist, so it's kind of esoterically adding it without uh, getting it in the way of anything else that actually needs this range. Um, adding back a little bit of brightness, but then attenuating it also to kind of you know preserve it without it getting out of hand. So when we add this. So he brings some of that life back. It makes it sound a little bit more natural. And then we're going to come back to our other friend, the doubler. A little bit more aggressive this time. Let's take this all out of focus. So we strip this off. Also worth mentioning, I didn't mention this with the background vocals, but this kind of holds true with uh, background vocals, strings and horns, is you can generally be more aggressive with your time-based effects too, which is going to be next week's topic, so we'll, we'll get more into that. Uh, but in general, you kind of want to intentionally apply, specifically reverb you and, and your tempo delays, you can apply more of those effects to auxiliary channel or auxiliary parts uh, because the effect of having more time-based effects moves uh, like psychoacoustically has the effect of moving that part further back like in your front to back imaging of your perception of the song uh, it has the effect of moving it backwards which allows your mono elements like your lead vocal your kick snare bass to stay front and center and then these just kind of occupy the background think of it as like where they would live if you were watching this happen on stage um it's gonna be a little bit further back in the stage a little bit more uh of that information is going to be reflected before it gets to you um so yeah that's another consideration as well i'm sending this through uh all of my time-based effects here uh in varying degrees but most heavily through my tempo delay and through my long reverb uh, same deal with these these patty background vocals but yep there's quick overview of strings and now we're going to switch to horns bear with me again while i switch sessions Okay, uh, same deal with this one. It is as yet unreleased, but um, actually this one is going to be available uh, tonight at midnight. So if you feel like staying up for a little while longer, uh, you can go check this one out. This is a brand new artist named Lily King, L-I-L-L-I-E King. Uh, you can check her out on your platform of choice. Uh, this song specifically, it's her debut single and it will be available 
uh, tonight at midnight. So please go check that out if you enjoy what you hear. Um, but yeah, until then, I'm not going to spoil the surprise and play any vocal elements for you. But uh, there's a, a pretty nice horn section on this song, so it's going to be a good example for this. Um, before we even look at it, like again, if you look at this chain, noticing a pattern, it's pretty much the same as in terms of the elements I'm using, not obviously the processing is a little bit different, but in terms of my effects or my processing chain elements and order, pretty much the same as the other stuff, specifically the uh, background vocals. See, so we got optical compression on the way in, channel EQ, full tech EQ, doubler. And that's, uh, that's generally a winning uh, string of elements that I find. Uh, let me find some section to play you here. Alright, so uh, in this case, we have uh, it's a three member horn section, but uh, it's a little bit more than that. So we've got uh, a tenor sax player, a trombone player, and a trumpet player, but each of them I had play twice, uh, similar uh, logic to triple tracking each part of a harmony in background vocals except in this case I'm only going to do it twice uh, because these elements are so loud that you uh, three tends to be too much in my experience but also two is just enough to where you can put it in stereo and have it balanced on both sides of the stereo image so uh, each player played twice but then I had the trumpet player also play two more times his part but an octave up uh, which just adds it's kind of just like the sound here. I'll take it out. So without it. So nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's perfectly respectable. But then and all of a sudden you got a horn sound. So here's what that sounds like dry. So, not bad. A little dull, perhaps. Uh, you definitely can tell we are going to want to boost some of that top end, but let's, let's listen for the frequency space that we have open here in the instrumental. So we got, got a drum set, bass, Fender Rhodes, and a guitar. tell the high highs are open and keep in mind this is without the lead vocal so but like the top end is is has plenty of real estate still um a little bit in the mid-range as well that guitar is not sucking up too much of that uh our low end is quite spoken for uh as is the majority of our low mid so 
compressing on the way in just to kind of glue these parts together so again puts all all four of those uh, performances kind of on equal footing then we move to our EQ so we're taking out all of our sub frequencies up to 200 low passing down to 13 and a half kilohertz a little bit of compression just tiny amount just for the very front edge um, And then we're taming some of this low mid. Like we said, there's not a lot of space there. So we're rolling off on our low shelf from 400 uh, down about two decibels, taking a lot out of uh, the top of the low mids at uh, 750 hertz, because that's right where that both the guitar and the roads are kind of fighting for that space anyway. So I think if I remember right, I gave it to the roads in this mix. and pull the guitar back because the Rhodes was more important uh, in this song, whereas the guitar was a little bit more percussive, a little more ornamental. The Rhodes is the main harmonic element, so uh, and it takes up a lot of that space, so just keeping this out of that way too. Uh, pulling back at 3,000, again a decent amount, 5 dB. Uh, that's kind of the harshness of, of brass, so like if I take this out, if I get rid of it. A little nicer. Uh, and then I'm actually rolling off a little bit, just a tiny, like half a decibel. This is just to keep it out of the way of the vocal, uh, which I'm not going to play you, but it was clashing with the lead vocal in this range. So I rolled it off. But again, we can do that because we are going to come to our pull tech. And in this case, I'm not addressing the low end at all. Um, and I'm only addressing the top end, uh, which is kind of the important bit uh, that these strings are going to occupy. So we're boosting pretty aggressively way up at 12 kilohertz. Uh, but then we're attenuating a little bit from 5 kilohertz, which remember was where our vocal clash was happening. So we've got this sloping cut coming down and then kind of halfway through that cut it starts coming back up and, co and like recompensating for it so it's easier to hear rather than to explain so so all of a sudden you've got this crispness of the horn section uh, but it's not harsh it's crisp and clear and distinct articulated but not uh, not sharp or nasty or anything like that. So there, like off of our first EQ stage, it's pretty, you know, I mean, it fits if you listen with the track. <laughs> Sounds fine. Uh, but again, like we kind of lose the contortions we have to put it through to get it to fit in the remaining frequency space kind of tends to suck the life out of it. So... And then again, we're just going to throw on a doubler. Because you notice, like, here, if we take this back off, just off of the pull tech, if we play that in context. really fun with horns to apply like liberal amounts of your tempo delay 
So like you can hear it, like if I solo this up. really nicely this is i can use this as an example so if i didn't apply any time-based effects to this it would sound like this so, but it's like it sounds like it's right next to you and it sounds like it's in front of the band which isn't the case i mean the lead vocalist is in front of the band the horn section is not going to be out front so i'm going to put it through our room reverb that we've got most of the elements going through and then our long reverb that was set relative to the lead vocal but we're going to throw some of this in it too so if we add those in <laughs> that's already that's better spatially speaking but then we're going to add a slap delay it's going to give it just some attitude here <laughs> See how that just kind of makes that front edge hit a little harder. You know, have some fun with it and wash it out. Throw this tempo delay. And now it's part of the band. leaves us with one remaining element to speak to well kind of two and we'll both uh we'll address both of them in this next session this is the last time i'm switching so one more time All right, so we're over here. We got this really big session. Got drums, bass, two guitars, lead vocal, some on lyric, background vocals, uh, some gang vocals, <laughs> some pad background vocals. So we got a lot going on. But we also, and then what we're going to talk about, well, no, we'll talk about the, uh, the lyric backup vocals first. So this version of this song is unreleased but uh the song has been released by this band previously so i'm going to give you just a little tiny little sneak peek just for the sake of this example don't tell anyone this album's probably coming out uh end of january so look for that but uh just to give you a sense here So you got that just, it's with the lyric, but it's a harmony to the melody. Um, again, it's never a bad idea to double track those so you can have it in stereo and keep it away from the center where the lead's going to be. Um, it kind of allows you to keep your fader lower. So it doesn't, it's not fighting for like uh, dynamic space, but it's still there because it's on the sides off it, like by itself. Uh, similar concept with these, except you're going to have, you don't have like the, uh, like the, the doubling or the pull tech stuff because these are a little bit more cut and dry. So pretty aggressive. Well, low threshold, low ratio, slow attack, fast release, like compression on the way in, um, just to kind of level it off here. I'll sew this up. Danny 
And again, notice the time-based effect. So that just kind of makes it jump out. Uh, because the attack is so slow, it makes the transient jump out, but then it grabs it, keeps so it's like you get the you feel the attack with the lead vocal, and then it gets out of the way of the note of the lead vocal. Uh, but then because the release is so fast, it kind of snaps back on the re on the release of the note, uh, which is just a cool effect. Kind of keeps it distinct, keeps it elevated from the beat. Uh, then a quick uh, EQ. Um, Keeping, you know, low end, low mid managing. Um, pretty aggressive cut here at 900. Roll off on the low end, high passing up to 200, low passing down to 15K. Uh, we're taking some of the top end information away too because that's where the lead vocal is going to be. So just, but not a lot, I suppose. I mean, it's only shelving down from 10K. So there's still high information in it, just uh, not the extremities of it where the lead vocal is really going to want to shine. But we are adding a little boost in the mid range, upper mid range here near 4,000. Just a little 1 dB boost. Uh, but it's a pretty wide Q range. So. That's kind of what uh, what you would consider like part of the telephone frequency range, like kinda that high, kind of tin canny sound. But uh, in this case, in this kind of music, I think it's appropriate to boost that range. And I've cut that range in the lead vocal, so that's okay. We're also going to add a de which is just a compressor that only works on the high frequencies. So it tames the uh, sibilant S uh, and CH vowel sounds, or sorry, consonant sounds. Um, but it also, in this case, I'm kind of, I've got it set pretty low on the threshold, so it's kind of acting on any time that vocal is active. Again, just to kind of, it allows this part to occupy the top end frequency space with the lead vocal. So like they can both live there, but the de -esser is going to compress this background vocal part. So uh, it kind of like, think of this as like setting a priority. So like lead vocal takes priority because it's not compressed in this range, uh, or at least not specifically compressed in this range. Uh, and then this background vocal is so whenever they get to this frequency range, this one's always gonna come in quieter than the lead. Um, and then we're adding one more compression stage just kind of for color, quick FET compression. Just to keep it distinct. Um, but that's kind of the, for me, that's always what I'm kind of thinking when I'm doing on lyric background vocals is I want the attack don't really want the sustain talking about the like the note envelope uh i want the attack don't really want the sustain kind of want the release just for like the attitude of it um i'd like to have them in stereo so i can keep them on the sides and they can be pretty heavily compressed just so um you know so they aren't pulling your attention away too much you can just kind of set it at a level and leave it there um and let everything else kind of move around it. Uh, but we're, another example we're going to pull from this piece is its percussive elements. So we have a couple of them. First up, we've got this giant cowbell here. In context. We also have also got some tambourines here. And for this, I'm going to mute out the back, uh, mute out the vocals because we're not there yet. And later on in the song, we also have some claps. Ooh. 
So with percussion, sorry, percussion elements, um, or as they're sometimes colloquially referred to as toys, um, big thing is just recognizing where the frequency most of them only have like one frequency not a lot of overtone content or at least not that you want um so understanding that you can be pretty aggressive with your equalization you also have to understand that they are generally pretty quick transients and not much sustain so you don't really need to compress them most of the time um, it's usually sufficient to do a pretty aggressive EQ and call it a day. So like on this cowbell, yeah. So taking out up to 200, low shelving from 900, because really you're looking at like 900 and up for this frequency. I mean, you you do have I guess what would be the fundamental of it lower than that, but you don't really need that. You really just need the actual stick attack of it. Um, then we are doing a little bit of a boost at 12K just to make sure it keeps its head above water. Similar idea with a tambourine. straight up just high passed up to 900 and that, that is it tambourines <laughs> need generally no help keeping their head above water um, in fact it's usually the opposite uh, a wise man once said that tambourine is too loud and they usually are uh, tambourines are kind of notorious for this so make sure if you're mixing a tambourine in that you're really Every time you want to move the fader up, you're really questioning why you're doing that and if you really need to do it. Um, and then, you know, if you do do it, walk away from it for a while and come back and check if you still want it that way because uh, <laughs> you you generally want to keep these pretty low. You notice, I mean, I've got my fader down here at negative 12 dB uh, on this tambourine. Um, elements like this could be panned or not. Uh, in this case with the cowbell and the tambourine, I've elected to keep them up the center uh, just because the way I was mixing them like with their faders, uh, that was fine to keep it there. They're not really competing for any space uh, with our mono elements. Um, they're also like, you know, instantaneous. They like, they don't, like I said, they don't really have sustain. So it doesn't really matter to keep them there. And because they're kind of drivers of the song, uh, just kind of keeping it plowing forward. It kind of makes sense to me to have them up the center. But if you had like temple blocks or bell kits or something like that, then yeah, you might want to pan those just because they have a little bit more of a pitch content. Uh, but you know, kind of on a case by case basis, they're not. I'm not going to say they're always mono, and I'm not going to say that they're always panned. Um, and then with this, with this clap, I've got it in stereo. Um, and this was done. You can hear this track bleed. It's because the whole band was uh, in the studio clapping around an Omni microphone uh, and there was a wedge in the room so they could hear like the track and clap in time. But we did that four times just so it sounds like, you know, more than just four people clapping at once. It sounds like 16 people clapping at once. Um, let me find where that comes in. So here we're actually cutting this top space as well as this low end space. So, you know, high passing up to 360, low shelving from 900, uh, high shelving down from 1650, and then low passing down to 13 and a half. So really not a lot of this frequency range that we want because it could be really aggressive like without it. That's really all the more we need from it. And then also we're going to add, this is a case where we will add some fast compression. Just 
just to keep it in check. Um, yeah, that's a quick example, but the, these elements really don't need to be overthought. Uh, generally, just, you know, getting out all of the low and low mid information in these uh, these these toy tracks will pretty much get you where you need to go. That's the case with uh, the elements we've seen here, or shakers, maracas, uh, temple blocks, you know, bell kits, spark trees, what have you. Um, yeah, so this has been our, our whirlwind rundown of auxiliary parts. <laughs> I hope it's been helpful. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about time-based effects. Uh, like the controls and operations, applications, uses of uh, reverb and delay, and chorus and flange, and things like that. Um, so yeah, tune back in same time next week for that. Uh, and until then, good luck. <laughs>